Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. Someone once noted that God made us in His image, and ever since we have tried to do God a favor by making Him in our image. It's easy to speak to others about the Jesus who cared for the poor, healed the sick, and preached love and justice for the least of these. But what about the God who tells the Israelites to wage war and kill entire people groups? Or threatens exile and then delivers? Or sends people to hell? Can these really be the same God? Our next guest says the simple answer is yes. Sid Brestel, uh, Bachelor of, of Arts from Moody Bible Institute, Master from Western Seminary, is a retired pastor who served a number of congregations for nearly 50 years. He has taught biblical classes at Kilns College in Bend, Oregon. He's passionate about creating opportunities for lay people to receive <coughs> biblical and theological training. He's ministered internationally in India, Pakistan, the United Arab Emirates, Uganda, and Ireland. God has given him a passion to proclaim and defend God's grace and His holiness and also His wrath. Here to discuss his new book, God in His Own Image, Loving God for Who He Is, Not Who We Want Him to Be, is Sid Brestel. Sid, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you and good morning. Good morning to you. Sid, uh, before we dig into the text of this book, I want to kind of take a journey back in time. Uh, okay. back, back to little Sid. And who were Sid's influences? And what was Sid's life growing up? And what was it that uh, helped form and shape your testimony, your story, your journey, and how faith became your own? I grew up on a, a wheat farm in the plains of a panhandle of Nebraska. And so I always wanted to be a farmer. My dad and mom became followers of Christ when I was about seven years old, uh, uh, Rabbi Eric. And we began to attend an evangelical church. I heard the gospel for the first time in Sunday school and uh, prayed as a child, best could at that time, to receive Christ. My father eventually became a pastor of the same church that he was saved in, ultimately. And then uh, in my heart, there was always this desire to be a preacher. But I'm an introvert by nature. Uh, going through school, I didn't raise my hand even if I had the answer. I didn't volunteer for oral reports. I would do all I could do to avoid them, haste the written, forget the oral. But still there was that burden in my heart. I think where it really changed for me was when my father stepped out of the ministry and I was a, a junior in high school. I was able to choose my own church and I went to a church where I heard grace and experienced love and fell in love with Jesus as I had not known him. And it was then that I decided to, to go to a Bible college. I chose Moody Bible Institute. So glad I did because that's where I met my wife. We've been married 53 years last week. Um, so for me, it was a journey of uh, overcoming the fear of people being in front. And even our first church, I see God's hand in that. I'm, I'm applying for a job. My wife is pregnant. And she sees that I've just graduated from Moody Bible Institute. And she's on a search committee for a little country church in Ohio. And she thinks it's an act of God that I'm a graduate of Moody because they had just written Moody that week to see if there was any alumni who might fill the pulpit or candidate. So I ended up taking this little country church that I didn't want to go to. And I spent seven and a half years there, and I've said over and over, it's the best seminary I could have ever attended. Because I had to preach Sunday morning, I taught the adult class, I preached Sunday night, I did the youth group. I learned that I could speak, and that God could use me to reach people that I could never have thought of, about reaching. Those seven and a half years were just amazing. God took a little church of 45 and grew it to over 220 people on a Sunday morning. Uh, it was all God's doing that I'm in the ministry today. You mentioned I pastored several churches, really only about three. There was a short co-pastorate planting a school, but all the other churches have been long, longer term. I just retired from Foundry Church after serving 22 years at Foundry Church. So I'm a shepherd. I love my people. I don't like moving. Every time we've moved from church to church, God has forced me out of where I'm comfortable into a place where I'm less comfortable, only to discover God knew best. 
So our journey with God has been delightful. I, I would change nothing. So as you were pastoring, uh, ministering the word of God, uh, preaching the full counsel of heaven, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit <clears throat> in a balanced manner, not the uh, let's just uh, Jesus only and uh, as if he passed through the birth canal with a three-ring binder tucked under his arm called his plan of salvation. Uh, certainly he can't present the plan of salvation without including the Father uh, in that and in the narrative of Jesus <coughs> saying that I'm leaving to go prepare a place for you, but I'm going to send someone, uh, the counselor, the comforter, the uh, uh, paraclete uh, to be with you, to, to help you uh, along the way, to help guide, lead you, and protect you, and advocate for you. When you would talk to people about God, did you find that they had preconceived notions? Did they have uh, an affinity, if you will, towards more of the uh, sweet Beatitudes, Jesus, the uh, peacemaker, the meek, the, uh, <clears throat> they began to gravitate towards this um, gentler, kindler God. Uh, you know, for me, starting in the ministry 50-some years ago, in the Midwest where it was very conservative, I think there was still that healthy respect for a holy God, and sometimes maybe to the extreme, that all we heard about was hellfire, brimstone, and being saved from that. But over the years, I've seen that pendulum swinging toward, again, we want a safe God, a God that we can manage, a God that is so good he would never send anybody to hell, He's a kind, gentle father. And it even shows up in our, in our music, I think, today. So often today we're focusing on the love and the grace and the mercy. And those are great attributes. When God introduces himself to Moses in his self-revelation there in Exodus, God begins with five of the kinder, gentler attributes. But then he says, but. And then he talks about that he is a God who will judge and he will punish, even to this third and fourth generation. So... I think we've seen the pendulum swinging over and over to the grace and mercy. My point, grace has no meaning if God is not a God also of justice and wrath. I don't need mercy if God isn't a God of justice and wrath. Those words are meaningless. They're just empty, fluff. I need that healthy respect of God to enjoy and celebrate the love, the kindness, the patience, the grace, the mercy. All those kinder attributes of God. You know, I wrote the book originally with the title, Fear and Wonder, Celebrating God's Kindness and Severity. I'm glad that Moody picked up the uh, book, and I love the title that they've chosen with my, with my agreement to that. But it's in Romans 11.22 is what the book was based upon, where Paul says in that context of cutting off the Jews and grafting in the Gentiles, but then a warning, <laughs> I can take you out too where he says, behold the kindness and the severity of God. We love the kindness. We ignore the severity. But it's still there, even if I'm pretending it's not there. I found that that word severity only appears in Romans 11.22, and it appears twice in that verse. And so it sent me on a search, a word study. What is this word, and why is it only used here? Why does it use a common word like wrath or justice or anger? And it was a very appropriate word for that context of cutting off and grafting in. So it made me just think, I need to talk about this. So I taught that in Ireland, and I taught that in Uganda. And I have a friend, Larry Libby, who's an editor, a freelance editor, a friend of mine, was part of our church till he moved away. And he said, upon looking at the notes of what I had taught in Ireland and Uganda, you need to write a book. I never intended to write a book. In fact, I began the book with that. A book that was never, it was never on my bucket list to write a book. Looking back, though, I'm grateful that Larry challenged me to do it because it was a great experience for me to grow deeper in love with God, 
to come to appreciate his severity and see that that too is a good attribute. If God doesn't have wrath and justice and he lets people get away with murder, with what happened under the Nazis or what happens under communist China or Russia when millions are exterminated, or today, when, when states in the United States are passing laws that you can take a baby's life up to the moment of birth or even after. That's infanticide. I want a God who says enough is enough. A God of justice. That requires the harsher side of God. And so even his harsher side is something to be praised and loved and worshipped. Do you think that the average parishioner can answer the question, why did God create man? Why does God what? Why did God create man? Oh, and uh, are you asking why, why people no, ask that? No, no, I'm, I'm saying, do you think that the, the average parishioner struggles with the question, yeah. Uh, really, you know, which which then goes to what is my purpose? What what was I created for? What if, was I created to do? If we ever turn off the noise, and we live in a noisy world today, it bothers me. I, I love hiking in the mountains, and when I see somebody hiking with earbuds and listening to music, I'm thinking, listen to the birds, listen to the stream. If we would ever turn off the sound and be silent, then I think we begin to get in touch with the idea that who am I? In this great huge universe, why am I here? Why, who made me? Why did God make us? You know, David, Psalm 8, who is man that you are mindful of him? I think we naturally go there if we'll just turn off the volume and stop and listen and think. Who am I? Uh, you know, when I think of the awesomeness of the universe, we haven't found the end. We know there was a beginning. Who did it? Where did this energy come from? And why so much? One star would have been enough to impress me. And so I think it naturally I come back to say, who am I? And I have to say, I, I believe that I am the product of, of God who created me. And the question is why? Why in his image? And I'm not sure that a lot of people in the pew even think about that anymore. We're too happy just to come and, like you say, have our 35 minutes of somebody feed me and let me enjoy my my time um, but again if we'll stop and let god's spirit work in our hearts we are driven to that augustine you have created us for uh, for your pleasure and our hearts will never be satisfied until we find our satisfaction in him in god if it happened with augustine it happens to us you know, Jesus said, come to me like little children. I, I watch little children who uh, <clears throat> truly embrace the, uh, and marvel at God. They, they have the imagination. They have the uh, ability to relate uh, toys and, and uh, scenarios. They... You know, big to them is big, big. It's, it's bigger than, and, and the older we get, the more limited big becomes to us. Uh, big becomes a square footage or acreage or <clears throat> has a standard of measure to it. And in the awesomeness of God and the largesse of God, uh, there is no standard of measure that man can create to measure God. But when we look at his nature, the true nature of God, uh, we get these messages that say God is love. Right? So there, there, there you have it. God is love. Uh, but then we get the uh, 1 Corinthians 10, love is patient, love is kind, love is not easily angered, love keeps no records of wrong. Love takes no joy, and, and we go on uh, to look at that. Do we tend to try to fit God into that image and look at his attributes uh, as being all the love attributes? But then he goes on to tell us in the book of Hebrews that uh, a father who doesn't discipline his child doesn't love 
his <clears throat> child. So how do we reconcile discipline and love being patient and kind and not easily angered and then told that if we don't discipline, then we don't love? Even the word discipline, though, is a loving word. It's to disciple somebody. Uh, so discipline isn't always the severe, harsh, correcting side. Sometimes it's the gentle instructing. Sometimes it's the rewarding. Good boy. I'm so proud of you. It's the affirmation side. You know, I think one of the problems we have when we're trying to define God our way is we use our definitions. And so what is love? And so love is always being gentle, kind, peaceful. Again, a parent who loves his child and sees the child doing something that will put his life at risk or his character at risk will respond. And sometimes that response does require strong discipline. So we have to take God's definition of what's fair, what's love. We ask, how can a fair God do this, do that? First of all, the story is not finished yet. We don't know how the story ends. And then we have our definition of what's fair. It usually means comfortable. I want something comfortable. And that's why, again, I think we want to treat God like, I use the analogy there, a box of chocolates. I pick and choose my favorite and let somebody else have the other one. For me, it's dark chocolate. We have a candy dish here that my wife keeps for the grandkids. And I'm not tempted unless there's some dark chocolate in there. And then I sneak them out and put them in my office. I'm a hoarder of dark chocolate because that's my favorite. We treat God sometimes the same way. We like, to, we like to keep for ourselves our favorite attributes. I cannot do that. God is a person. I have all of him or none of him. Because if I, if I just exclude some of the attributes I don't like, I have created an idol. My people would never carve an idol out of wood. But do, can we do the same thing as pastors when we only talk to them about the kind side of God, the gentle side of God, and never warn about the dangerous, harsh, but fair side of God? We have created an idol. You may not be able to put it in your hand. You may not be able to carry it to church with you. But you have it in your mind and in your heart. He's an idol. He's not the God of Scripture. And that's why I wrote the book. I just believe that the pendulum has swung so far to the extreme today that our people are not even being warned. I think that's a good word. To be aware that God is not safe. But he's very good. To quote C.S. Lewis in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He's not safe, but he is good. We tend to think good means always safe, never do anything harsh. I have a God who's good, but he needs to be respected, and he deserves to be respected and to be loved for who he is. I love my wife for who she is. I can't just pick and choose on certain days this part I like. <laughs> I have the whole meal deal, and I love her. And the longer I've been with her, the more I appreciate all parts of Mary, not just the parts that drew me to her when I first met her. Does that make sense? makes complete sense. So we, we get our impressions of who God is um, oftentimes through our own father uh, because that's our natural representative mm -hmm. of what father God is. So if your father was harsh, then you think God's harsh. If your father was gentle, then you think God's gentle. Then you come into the study the vacation Bible or the Sunday school or uh, in, in my case the uh, rabbinical studies and, and the, the uh, Jewish studies of ethics and, and uh, Moses and the law <coughs> of Moses and, and uh, why uh, and I think I had a very strong foundation of the why of God, the why did God do these things, and and the miracles in which He performed, and the prophetic nature of God that He is revealing and has unveiled this magnificent plan for us. But we have to stay close to Him, and we have to listen carefully to Him in order to be in relationship with Him. We we tend to get confused in the doing for versus the doing with, and that confusion causes us to uh, be caught up in works and check mark 
checkbox Christianity as opposed to relational uh, faith. So uh, what is God like and, and what are our first impressions and how do we, how do we uh, package God in a way that is a true representation of the compound unity of God, the all the facets of God. I like your phrase there, first impressions. Uh, I think it's chapter two in the book, I talk about Moses, first impressions. So here's a young boy raised in a Hebrew home. I don't know what Jochebed did, but she certainly ingrained some truth in that little boy who then is adopted into Pharaoh's family and raised as an Egyptian, a polytheistic pagan culture. And now he's out in the desert for 40 years and he's got time to think. And then he sees the burning bush. First impressions, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. God is not to be meddled with. Second experience that Moses has is on the road to Egypt when he's going to become the deliverer as God has convinced him he's going to be. And uh, he's nearly killed for failing to obey or apply the sign of the covenant in his own son's body. Now his impression, totally not to be messed with, this, the, the plagues, what's his impression? This God is powerful. And he keeps his word. He's doing what he said he would do. And now they finally march out of Egypt with, with booty aplenty. And he's a good God. And then the sea parts in front of them. He's a powerful, protective God. And then he feeds them and he puts up with their complaining. And then Moses begins to grow through experiences with God. Until he finally gets to that point. They're in Exodus. And he says, I want to see your glory. And it says there that he spoke with God as a friend with a friend, or a man to man. I think it's the analogy holds up for us, experiences. Every one of us had first impressions of God. As a little child, God is good. I remember that. God is big. I remember that. God gave us this food. I remember that. And then as we grow and as we begin to get into the word, and that's where the Holy Spirit begins to take and shape our impressions of God. I have to have an open heart when I open the book. Lord, show me who you are, not what I want you to be. And so I have these experiences with God's word through the Holy Spirit. I have life experiences. Those help shape my impression of God. So as you shared, if I have a father who was lenient, God's, God's a grandfather, a doting grandfather, boys will be boys. If my dad was harsh, then he's like cosmic cop, and that's who I talked about in the book. My, my first impressions of God became a cosmic cop, always looking over my shoulder, but never came close enough or fast enough when I needed him. But if I lose a loved one, and I go through hard, painful times, even that begins to shape my perception of God. And all those impressions and perceptions need to be shaped by the Word of God. And so I come back and let the Word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, change my thinking, correct my thinking. So when I preach as a father and I say, as a, as a pastor, and I say, God is your father, heavenly father, what do they hear? Not what did I say. Do they hear that abusive? Do they hear that father who left, left us, abandoned the family? Do they hear that that father was um, negligent? And so we have to keep on coming back to the word and say, here's what we mean. Heavenly Father, and then describe him as he is in Scripture. Amen. We're talking with Sid Brestel, author of God in His Own Image, loving God for who he is, not who we want him to be. If your image of God is provider, protector, and you're shocked and amazed that uh, how much you love the sweet Jesus, and then you find out that uh, Jesus is coming back, with the sword in his mouth, the chain in his hand, with the two-thirds <clears throat> of the heavenly host with him, the army of heaven to come defeat the armies of the Antichrist, to bring the conquering Messiah, not the suffering, but uh, the line of David, the king, uh, the line that rides on a horse in battle, not the humble king servant 
who comes to ride on a donkey. And so even within the facets of Jesus himself, who says, I only do what I saw my father do. I only say what I heard my father say. The gentle voice you hear is the voice of the father. And the harshness and the judgment of, of the words of Jesus are the same God, the same father. And when he returns to fulfill God's plan that he introduced us to in Genesis 3.15, as he told us there would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that he had to clear a path not only for the Messiah to be born, but a pathway for the Messiah to survive uh, the attack from Herod, to be able to <coughs> dispatch his angel, to tell Joseph it's time to move to Egypt and spare the boy. Uh, God was involved in all of that, orchestrating all of this for you. That's right, all of it Amen. for you. Yeah. And that's exactly the message of this book, that God in his own image right, is not the image that you want, it's the image that you need. And that is the God who created you so that you would come into relationship with him. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the kindness and the severity and where they meet and how they function and why they play out for your best interest. Why God's plan for you is a good plan, but you have to know him first. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach Revealing Prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on ignitinganation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.ignitinganation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting a Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame, and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. 
The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Sid Bristol, author of God in His Own Image, Loving God for Who He Is, Not Who We Want Him to Be. Sid, welcome back to the program. Thank you. You know, you started out by talking about uh, Moses, uh, Prince of Egypt, to becoming a friend of God, and... Uh, it really took 40 years to get Moses out of Moses before God could actually use him uh, at 80 uh, to become a messenger, uh, a prophet, if you will. The, the, the very word Navi in Hebrew means messenger of God, to bring God's word to the people. And so he chose Moses as this uh, messenger to uh, Pharaoh in fulfillment of a prophecy uh, that most people don't understand, that when God made his promise to Abraham, uh, mm -hmm. he said, you'll be a great nation, but this is how it's going to be. Uh, you're going to be enslaved in a foreign land uh, for 400 years. Now, if we take a look at the genesis of this story, uh, we, we find that my people were reduced to Joseph 1 plus 70. Mm -hmm. If, if uh, we looked if we, we looked at the California condor, when they got down to being 70, it's extinction. So all of a sudden they went through this huge restoration project, this huge conservation project to save the California condor okay, from extinction. Uh, God had his own plan uh, that during the famine to bring us into a place of a Pharaoh that would not know us, not know Joseph, and would enslave us but provide for us so that when we came out the other side of it, we went in as an ex as, as on the verge of extinction, and we left as an army of over 600,000 men <clears throat> age 20 and over. Okay? We came out as a nation uh, of over 2 million. And this was how God did that. Now, as you're reading the narrative, that would seem to be awfully harsh. And did God really turn a deaf ear to the plight of his enslaved people for 400 years? Because when it says, almost as if suddenly he heard their cry. Well, you know, in Exodus chapter 12, we see the midnight hour of the uh, 365th day of the 399th year at the 12 o'clock hour, which was at the end of 400 years they were no longer enslaved. God passed over, um, mm -hmm. and the people were, were released uh, as the death of the firstborn took place, and we found our freedom at the top of the hour uh, on the 365th day of the 399th year because we serve a God who is on time and does exactly what he says he's going to do. Now, in that kind of narrative, you have two aspects. You have this killing of the firstborn, both man and beast, uh, which impacted uh, the unbelieving Jews. And we don't read about the unbelieving Jews, but, but <coughs> we assume all the Jews, plus some Egyptians uh, in that mixed multitude. But we don't read anything about non-compliant uh, Israelites, uh, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me if we didn't find some record somewhere that uh, uh, the Schwartzes decided, no, nope, they weren't going to kill the lamb, they weren't going to put the, you know, they didn't believe it, and so, you know, they had this opinion. Uh, but you see both the, the uh, grace and the severity 
uh, in this same picture of the sacrifice of an animal, the taking of a life, in exchange for the lives, and if you weren't one who was willing to take a life, to save a life, then you would die. That's a very compound picture of a loving God who also is a God that is willing to accept a sacrifice and bring redemption through a sacrifice. Uh, mm -hmm. So one must die so that one must live. That's kind of a uh, conundrum, isn't it? Kind of a... Uh, um, it, it's, it seems counterintuitive, but it's exactly the message of Jesus that you have to die to live. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel, isn't it? It is. It really is. You know, the, the, I think the era of Moses that I enjoy the most is in Deuteronomy. Here's this 120-year-old statesman. He'd been there. He's done that. He's seen the worst and the best, but he's always seen God's faithfulness. And he's telling the new generation where they've been, why they wandered for 40 years. And he's telling them, now, look, here's the land that God's going to give you. By the way, when you go in there, you take out all of the people there because of the iniquity promised to Abraham 400 years earlier. You get the land that's going to wait 400 years. And then he warns them, don't you turn to idols. Don't even take one into your tent, lest you be tempted, because I will do to you what you're doing to them. So to me, using an old uh, phrase, the goose and the gander, if, if what God did through Israel to the Amorites and the Canaanites, God turns around and does to his own people in the exile to, Ju uh, to Babylon, but even in the Assyrian invasion and being scattered, why? Because they did the same thing as the people who were being taken out by God, by God's people. Israel was simply God's instrument to carry out justice. Because idolatry is a horrible thing. It, it, first of all, it damns us to hell, but look what it does to innocent children. No wonder God hates it. I use the analogy in, in the book, and I think it might even be one of the call outs. To walk into the Sistine Chapel and see the beautiful frescoes that Michelangelo painted there, and look and say, huh, a kindergartner could do better than that. That's an insult to the artist. Mm -hmm. And when we create something with our hands, out of gold or stone or wood, and we bow down and call it our creator, that's an insult to God. If nothing else came out of my study for the book is how much God hates idolatry and why. It's not right. something trivial. He shows it to us as complete foolishness. He says, you take this piece of wood, you cut, yeah. it, you cut it in half, you, cook your, you throw it into the fire and cook your meal with half the wood, and the other half you carve into an idol and you pray to it. Yeah. it it's illogical, it's unreasonable. Uh, how could you burn half of it in the fire uh, and the other half of it becomes sacred and holy. It makes no sense to God. How can it possibly make sense to man? Uh, in, that, in that instruction as he's giving, he's telling us not to intermarry. Uh, my, my people, uh, Jews, and I'm, I'm uh, 16th generation uh, on both sides of my family. No Gentile blood in as far back wow. as we can go. Uh, I, I've been to where... Uh, my family originated, uh, the city of their origin, uh, in the country of their origin, and, and uh, had marvelous experiences ministering uh, in Ukraine, in Poland, in Hungary, uh, where all my family is from. And I'd love to hear your story someday. It's, uh, and came to faith at age 44 and was ordained at age 55. So if you can imagine spending 35 years in the corporate world uh, mm. and, and coming out of the other side of this. But uh, the, the point being is that we can see the consistency of God. There's, there's one attribute of God and that of consistency because we see what happened to King Solomon. Here King Solomon mm -hmm. was the wisest 
and the most beautiful. Sounds kind of like somebody else who was the wisest and the most beautiful. And uh, um, had all appearances of all is well, all is good, until uh, King Solomon fell for the lust of his eyes and he began to take on women from other nations and then began at the end of his life to begin to make sacrifices to them. As we look at the 45 kings of Israel, uh, the first one being God, uh, we then look at the 44 natural kings of Israel, we find that there are very few good ones. Very few of them tore down the altars and the Asherah poles. Uh, many of them tore down the Asherah poles, but not the altars, or tore down the altars, but not the Asherah poles, but very few were considered to be good kings, and those were the years of prosperity for the right. children of Israel. Uh, we, we see this played out, but we don't seem to learn the lessons. We look at God as being uh, the tremendous teacher and the example setter. Uh, so because we don't get it, then he promises that he's going to make a new covenant with us in Jeremiah 31, 31, uh, new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the old covenant written on tablets of stone, but I'm going to write in my law. Still my law. He doesn't say a new law. He says my law, not a new law. I'm going to write my law in your minds. It will be in your hearts, and no longer will a man have to teach his brother to know the Lord, because they will know me from the least to the great. And Jesus comes along in Matthew 5, 17, and says, I didn't come to abolish the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Until heaven and earth pass away, not the least stroke of the pen shall disappear from this word. This is why we have one testament, okay? Not an Old Testament and New Testament, one testament, the <coughs> testimony of God. Uh, one book, one author, not 66 books and 41 or 42 contributors. Uh, one book, one, one author. Uh, so we see all this in the instruction. We see that uh, uh, blessed is the one uh, and we look at Mount Ebal, Mount Gerizim. We look, at, we, we look at this shouting back and forth of the good and the evil. Then we see a picture of Jesus on the Mount of Beatitudes uh, saying the same things. You've heard it was said. You know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, blessed is the one who... The, and so he recounts the blessings of God if we walk in the admonition of God. So the foundations, obedience is better than sacrifice. And we don't embrace the full personality, the full image of God, and we don't relate it to our own lives where you have disciplined your children or you have uh, taken things away from them uh, and withheld things from them, not love, but things uh, to try to teach them a valuable lesson uh, you've made their life uncomfortable so that they could find uh, comfort. This is what God has done for us. Where do we get confused? Where do we lose our way? And how do we get back to walking along the way and embracing uh, the message of Jesus, which was, which was, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm bringing you the, the message of the Father. I'm not bringing you my message. <clears throat> I think we've gone astray again when we try to ignore the revealed word because it's uncomfortable, because we prefer something more pleasant. How do we get back? I think back to the Bible. Go back to the book because it is his revelation. I love the title of the last book in the Bible, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's a, it's, a, it's a book about a person, not just the end times. We love to take that book and carve it up and make it fit our eschatology, our, our belief of future things. But it's first and foremost a picture of Jesus. And so I see him in the first chapter. It's indescribable. When we can't describe something, we use the word like. So his feet were like burnished bronze. His eyes, his, his clothes was like linen and then I see him walking in chapters 2 and 3 between the churches, among the churches. And then I see both a kind and a very harsh Christ there, Messiah there. 
because some of the things that he warns the churches that he will do to them would shock us if we would actually read them and think, who said that? And to whom is he speaking? He's speaking to his church, his disobedient church, who has gone away from him. And then to read the rest of the book of Revelation and just see him, as you described him, that, that soldier on a war horse, not, not a, a gentle person on a donkey. And yet both the lion and the lamb I can't have one of the without the other. So we come back to the book. It's our responsibility as pastors and teachers and theologians to tell the people not what they like to hear, but what they need to hear. Behold your God. I, I love Isaiah 40. Again, the background is the imminent invasion of Babylon. It's a dark, dark period. And verse 1, uh, there's a cry. Comfort, comfort my people. Speak kindly to them. Verse 6, what can I say? What should I tell them that will comfort them? Verse 9, get on a mountaintop and yell at the top of your lungs, Behold your God, Israel. That's what we as pastors and teachers need to be today. Men on the mountaintop, men on the city walls shouting, clearly as loud as we can behold your god as he is not as you would like him to be but as he's revealed himself to be both kind and severe and love him for both of those attributes bring the pendulum back to the middle and, and tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth Sid, what do you think would surprise people the most as they read this book? Uh, what, what's the shocker for them? What's the, the, I never realized that about God before? Interesting you asked that question, because just this last Sunday, somebody came up to me after the uh, church service. I'm not the preacher anymore. I'm just being there as a, as a parishioner, as a, as a attendee. And they said, you know, I loved your book, and I could hear you speaking, but the thing that I think I take away the most is I didn't really appreciate you need the severity for the grace and the mercy and the love to make any sense. The very things that we don't want to talk about become the backdrop for people to comprehend and appreciate the things we love to talk about and love to sing about. For him, that was the takeaway. I'm hoping people, though, if they finish the book, and they come to the last chapter, there are seven, Taste and See, that they will be challenged to now step out and by faith, accept God as he has revealed himself, and discover he is good. In his severity, he is good. In his kindness, he is good. He's always faithful. He's never, never unfaithful. I woke up this morning singing to myself, great is thy faithfulness. Summer and winter, you know, all these things, unchanging. And every morning, new mercies. And I want them to taste and discover God as he is. You can't really enjoy him. And I think we are to enjoy him. You know, the Westminster Catechism, what is the purpose of man, chief purpose and aim of man? To know God and to enjoy him. I can't enjoy him if all I have is this little Casper milk toast that I've created, that I can play with and I can manipulate. But I can enjoy him when I know that he is severe. He could do anything. He could wipe us out and be just and do the right thing. And yet he forgives and he's patient and patient and patient. Uh, I love God as he is. That's the only way I can all right. enjoy him. I hope people take that from the book. You know, as you make that... that uh... A statement about the kindness and severity. I, I hear the words of Paul saying, you know, listen, the law is not bad. If it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't know that I was a sinner. Uh, if, if we don't have the framework in which to examine things, if we don't have uh, a, a God's hypothesis, which is then proved out, that God loves us, uh, he loves us with an everlasting love, that uh, he is... Uh, uh, the embodiment of patience. He's the embodiment of forgiveness. He's the embodiment of grace. But he's also the embodiment of correction. And he's the embodiment of 
uh, uh, the refiner's fire and the, the potter's hands and the, um, the tearing down for the purpose of building up better. Not the tearing down for the purpose of destruction, but for the rebuilding uh, as Nehemiah rebuilt the walls to build them stronger, to endure the test of time for you to be strengthened. He's the God who prunes to make room for new growth. He's the God who disciplines so that you will have the right attitude to receive the blessings that he has promised you. He makes these promises and then he lays them out there for us to walk on the path that he set for us. If we stray from it, we cannot be surprised at where our destination takes us. You know, it, it, and, and so uh, we tend to blame God. We, we tend to attribute uh, our behaviors to him when the fact is, is that he gave us this contrary nature, the same contrary nature he gave to the angels. Uh, that's why a third of them fell and followed Satan, because they were given this contrary nature. They had the choice to stay or go. But then we see that our fate is the same as the angels, that we become confirmed in our holiness. When we no longer are able to sin, we're in the new heaven, we're in the new earth, we're in our glorified bodies, and we no longer are capable of sinning, and we enjoy this rich eternity that God has promised us where there is the streets of gold, where there are the walls of jasper, where there are no tears. There is no sun, there is no moon, there is no temple because the, the light is there. God and the sun are there with us for all eternity and we get to worship around the throne of God there. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts who was and is and is to come. And it's glorious and it's wonderful if we'll just believe in God, in all of God, not just the pick and choose. Is he has the wisdom to know when harsh is right and gentleness is correct. We don't. Mm -mm. We want to write the book and say, I know better. Uh, no, he knows and he always acts appropriately. He's righteous. He does the right thing. Even when I don't understand it at the moment. I can trust him. We all should be like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, seated in front of God, and I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his garment mm -hmm. filled the temple, and the angels cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And I realized that I was a man of unclean lips, and I fell to my knees and said, Whoa! I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. Now, he had been prophesying for five chapters. This mm -hmm. is now in the sixth chapter when he realizes, I've been prophesying in my own strength. I can only do this in the strength of the Lord. So the Lord sends an angel with a coal and burns his lips. And then he says, now, who should I send? He, Isaiah says, send me. Okay? Because now he's embraced He's embraced the majesty and the sovereignty and the power and the mercy of God who is willing to take one of unclean lips, one operating in his own strength and purify him to be able to do God's work. Mm -hmm. Love that. As you share that, I'm thinking uh, today there seems to be a lack of awareness of the severity of sin in the church and the need for repentance. And it's because we have not presented to them the God that Isaiah saw high and lifted up. The natural response is when God is lifted up high as he should be, I'm a sinner and God, I need repentance. Amen, amen. We've been talking with Sid Brestel, author of God in His Own Image, loving God for who he is, not who we want him to be. Sid, we have run out of time, but I thank you Thank you for Thank this you. great work and for this message that I believe will be transformational for people to understand both the love of God and the character, the true nature of God through your words. Thank you so much and may God richly bless you. We're going to take a short break Thank and you. when we come back we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.